three and three year old class of 35 kids in the 12 by 12 room. Oh, you were great. Want you to know there's an anointing. There's once we didn't pray, we used to shut the door and not let any parents or kids in until we was done praying. One time we didn't do that because we just thought we ought to get with it because we was a little late. Once you know there's little kids hanging off other little kids with their fingers up their nose and then their ears and tearing each other's clothes off and fighting and gouging in the eyes. And I thought, next week, why don't we pray? Yeah, all right. That was the only time in four years that we didn't pray over that service. I want you to know, when we prayed, we had four learning centers going in a 12 by 12 room with 35 kids. There was a story over here. There was snacks over here. There was a craft over here. And I forget what this one was. I remember my little buddy, he had detached lenses, and his father wanted him to be a football player, but he had detached lenses, he hit his head like that, and his lenses in his eyes would go all goofy. And he was helping me teach two and three year olds. Amen. And he was this brilliant guy that had a massive data bank at the Bureau of Mines at the University of Nevada, and he would maintain that <coughs> data bank, and that's who he was. And the kids would sit on his lap and look at him, and he'd be explaining a rainbow. Now, when the sun gets at a 35 degree angle, and it shines through the droplets of water. The Drop. air, the, and he'd be going on, the kids would be going. Hmm? We're talking two-year-olds. They had no idea what he was saying. They just knew that he knew what he was talking about. They knew he loved them, and he did. He was just the greatest guy. We'd have uh, uh, birthdays for dead composers. <laughs> Seriously, we'd get together. We'd have cake and ice cream and soda pop, and we'd have birthday parties for dead composers, like on Beethoven's birthday, mm -hmm. we'd go and get a, a record, it used to be records in those days, yeah. we had records, and we'd put a Beethoven record on, and he would tell us why Beethoven had written it. And he'd give us all the history behind Beethoven and all this stuff, and then we'd sit down and listen to this record, and it was just, I mean, I got culture. He thought I needed some culture. Some of you need some culture, too. My girlfriend at that point in time, she thought I needed a cultural show. She took me to a, a play. And I thought, oh great, a play. You know, I was a, you know, I was a guy. <laughs> so she took me to this play, and I sat down, and we were right towards the front. And when the curtains opened, there's all these people standing on stage, and they had this rouge on them and black things, and they're all dressed up, and they went. And I was like enthralled by this. Before they said a word, I was hooked. I want you to know, culture is my thing. Yes. I like the I like the dead composers. I like the I like. I saw three times. I saw Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. I saw it once professionally in Reno, the first time. Then I saw it on TV, yeah. right? Fiddler on the Roof. And then I saw it at Reed High School. Oh, Hands down, yeah. all the way. Reed High School was the best one. Great. Best singers. Best actors, best everything. It was awesome. When Regina graduated from uh, high school, you know that song? Okay. Uh, uh, how does that start? A wee wee In the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight. Anyway, as they're coming down, they had one person singing this part, and he was walking down the thing, and they had the spotlight, and then they changed the spotlight, and another guy would be singing the next part, and another guy, she said it was just the most awesome thing there ever was. So I want you to know there's creativity to be had. Yes. And sometimes when we get churchy eyes, we forget about the creativity of the arts. And they're just the most beautiful thing. You ever been in church where the guys are dancing? Yes. I mean, and look, doing flags and stuff? Yeah. You used to embarrass the crap out of me. <laughs> now, I would love to have a place big enough for the kids yeah. to just get up here and, yes. you know, right now we tried it once. <laughs> they'd, be going, oh. <laughs> they'd be sword fighting up here, so we couldn't do the, do the flags, They're, especially the little guys. They'd be whacking each other. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so if you go to, with me to Zechariah, that's right before Malachi, right before Matthew. So if you find the New Testament, you're almost there. And I bring my phone in. Praise the Lord. So right before we go into the Word, if you guys are hot, you can uh, yeah, you've already open the window. Mm -hmm. you can open the door if you want it, isn't that? All right. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Zachary, which? Yeah. 
I had to turn Huh? Which? Zechariah, the tenth chapter. Oh, it's all closed off. Never mind. <laughs> You think the pastor would climb up on his chair and open that up? You would think. Myself, I want you to know I like to sweat, so if you're hot, I got, I got a fan. <laughs> One last story before we get into the word. My wife was right in the front seat and she had this fan. She just fanned herself and says, Man, I'm having a hot flash. The kid goes, What's a hot flash? The grandson in the back seat. He's four. What's a, what's a hot flash, Grandma? Says, well, all of a sudden you get really hot. You just get really hot. And so she gets that. She's in t like two minutes later and says, Grandma, Grandma, hand me that fan. I'm having a hot flash. You young guys have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the girl will. Wait for it. <laughs> Actually, I've realized that menopause and even PMS are something you can get through yes. if you pray yes. and seek the Lord and get the Spirit of God ruling over your emotions instead of PMS or all that stuff. You don't have to go through whatever. Amen. Else Thank you. You're welcome. That's right. It's really true. Regina didn't go crazy. <laughs> My aunt went crazy. <laughs> Oh my God, she went just insane, crazy. But Regina don't know how to pray. Praise the Lord. Or else you just take a lot of value. Is that Zantac? No, that's your Zantac. All right, let's go on. Dig it a hole for myself. Zachariah 1. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it penetrates not only our spirits, but our souls and our hearts and our minds and our bodies. Because God, this body is made for you and you for this body. Yes. So we open ourselves up, Holy Spirit, teach us today from your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So is it one or ten, Pastor? Ten one. Ten one, okay. Ten one. So it has a one out of ten. Zechariah, ten one. It says, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. Mm -hmm. He will give them showers of rain, yes. grass in the field for everyone. Now you notice this, he says, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. You think, you know, if there's clouds and there's lightning and stuff, it's going to rain. Mm -hmm. Now you and I both know mm -hmm. that is not the truth. Yeah. <laughs> not in Nevada, not especially not in Fernley. Yeah. Yeah. You can have clouds everywhere and just kind of goes, <laughs> like that, remember? Yeah, so he says, ask the Lord in the time. So if you know God's blessing is yes. in your life, you know the favor of God is upon you, sometimes you're just going to have to not take that for granted, right. or you need to go ahead and ask. I wrote down here, we are not just to assume that God will send the rain, we are to ask for the rain. Why? Relationship. Mm -hmm. Communication. Yes. I will be your God and you shall be my people. Mm. We are in relationship with a God. He's the God, we're the people. We the people and He the God. So if, if He's a God, then He can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way I figured. He can send rain. If He says, if it says in His Word that I'm supposed to ask rain in the time of latter rain and He will send the rain, okay, then I'm to assume that He's going to do it. But He says, ask. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? Mm -hmm. God just likes relationship. Yes. He could just make it happen by, what, what do you call that? Um, just naturally. Uh -huh. <laughs> or, how do they say that? Um, uh, what do they migrate by? Uh, instinct. Uh -huh. I want you to know, they don't migrate by instinct. Amen. The Holy Ghost leads them where they're supposed to go. Sure. Amen. Well, you, if you want to write it off to Mother Nature and deify her, that's all right with me. As long as it's somebody. Okay? Because things just don't happen by natural causes, okay? I want you to know that I can see you because God created my eyes. I can touch you because God created my fingers. Not only my fingers, but the feelers in my fingers. Mm -hmm. And not only the feelers in my fingers, but the nerves that go from here into my brain and send them back and think I'm feeling with my hands. No, I'm feeling with my brain. Mm -hmm. What is that? That can't be. <laughs> I could go crazy. I just won't. <laughs> Not today. 
<laughs> our relationship is with God. In Zechariah 1.13, he says, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Sometimes we get off, I don't know about you, about Monday afternoon, if I don't get into the Word or something like that, I'm a heathen. By Monday, no, that's not say afternoon. By Monday, about 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm a heathen by then. If I don't seek the Lord in some way, if I'm not on purpose putting my heart and my mind before the Lord, then I'm just going to function like every other unbeliever on the face of the earth. I am not going to function by faith. But if I come before Him, acknowledge Him, His presence within me comes alive again, and I begin to walk in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Just hearing about faith won't do anything for you. You must someday go ahead and function by faith. And go ahead and believe God. And we'll get into that, huh? I don't want to jump too far ahead of myself here. Okay. So it says, return to me. This was good for me this week because I was off on Monday afternoon when I started. No, it was Monday morning. About three. Oh, I think you got off fast. But yeah, three in the morning. Okay. Return to me. And I thought, Lord, I return to you right now. It says, Lord, if I return to you, you will return to me. And you are the Lord of hosts. You're the one that controls the angels. You're the one who spoke stars into existence. You're the one that created the heavens and the earth. You're the one who does everything for me. Lord, I come to you right now and believe in you love me and you are powerful enough to help me walk with you today. Just those little things. What did that take? 15 seconds? Maybe 10? Just that will cause your relationship with God to change. Because if you're just thinking about Him, that's okay. But if you begin to communicate with Him, what does he say? When he says ask, he's, that means ask out loud. Yes. Yes. How about this? You know, you ever get the one? <laughs> See, I just asked for rain. I thank God for it. <laughs> Sometimes you got to say it because your thoughts are louder than your other thoughts. Sometimes you got to say what you believe mm -hmm. rather than what you're thinking. That's right. Because I was laying there this morning. My, my alarm goes off pretty early, right? So I, this morning I punched it for a half an hour later. I thought, all right, another half, because I was really tired. You know? So I laid down another half an hour, and I start thinking about stuff. It wasn't really good stuff. I wasn't thinking about, no, and, and then I started thinking about terrible stuff, and I'm going, well, I'm getting out of bed. <laughs> it's about three minutes, you know. <laughs> I punched that sucker off, and it was, that was a done deal of that. Sometimes when God wakes you up, you need to go ahead and get, get up. He's been waking me up at 2.30. I mentioned that to him. Well. <laughs> You're probably to blame over there. I preached a message on getting up early and seeking God early once, and Diane says, God woke me up last night at 1. I got, I got a bone to pick with you, boy. <laughs> she gets up and writes a bunch, bunch of stuff down, God has said. God calls us to seek him early. Why? Because the devil isn't awake. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> you don't think it's true. The devil ain't awake at that time of day, as far as I'm concerned. When I get up in the morning nice and early and everything's quiet, nobody's around and things like that, I can talk to God and I'm not bugged. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not anything. I'm just, just communicating with God. I go walk up in the hills and, and sometimes the moon is out. And Anyway, it's just beautiful. And I'm thinking, well, the enemy isn't up this time of day. Well, boy, come 8 o'clock. Or when I get back down at like 7 o'clock and things start happening, I figure he wakes up and says, hey, you did demons, get out, get, let's go. That's only theory, by the way. <laughs> Erase that from the. Uh, Matt's a, Matt thinks the devil's asleep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was just kidding. Yeah. He's it's not scary. asleep. Look at that part. Sorry, bud. Sorry, bud. Zechariah 4. This is good. I, I just like this. The angel of the Lord who talked with me answered and said, Do you not know what these things are? And he said, No, my Lord. In the sixth verse of the fourth chapter, this is Zerubbabel. He says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O mountain, before Zerubbabel, who shall become a plain? And he shall bring forth a capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Now watch this. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O mountain? I want you to know, if you don't speak to your mountains, your mountains will speak to you. 
They'll wake you up in the middle of the night and have you awake thinking about stuff like I was thinking about this morning. You will be you you won't be able to go to sleep because your mountains are in the way. Sometimes you have to speak to your mountain so that sucker get out of your way so you can go to sleep. Sometimes you'll wake up in the morning thinking about your mountains. You need to speak to those things. Ah, I, I just lost my job. Let's go on. I, I got this. I got it. Huh? I'm going to do this in a row. In a row. First part first. Okay. Right on. Okay. Whew. Praise the Lord. <laughs> in Zechariah, the fourth, seventh, eighth chapters, we read about how God is telling these people how he does stuff and what they're trying to do to get close to him. They're trying to do prayer. They're trying to do fasting. They're trying to do religious ceremonies and things like that. And God just keeps coming against them, coming against them. And, says, and he says in the 18th, 19th verse of the 8th chapter, he says, when you fasted, did you fast for me? For me. He says it twice. You're doing this thing for God. So as you pray and you seek the Lord, what are you doing it for? Are you going after the gift? Or are you going after the giver? Mm -hmm. Do you care more about what he's given you or do you care more about the one who's given it? Mm -hmm. I want you to know God's in the relationship and he is a good father. Mm -hmm. He gives good gifts to those who seek him. But he is not so much interested in the gift. He's more interested in you acknowledging him that he's a giver. Not because he needs kudos. Because he likes you. Right. It's like your kid. You don't come to your your kid doesn't come to you and say, Oh Father, I just I've been so bad this week. I just pray that you please give me breakfast. Please, Daddy, give me breakfast. I need some breakfast. God doesn't ask us to beg him for stuff. He has to come before him and ask him for stuff. Ask him. There uh what's this what's the guy's name on the radio all the time? Uh, Joel Osteen. Okay. He was talking to his daughter the other day, and his daughter's, uh, I think she's 17, mm -hmm. something like that. And he, he was talking to her, and she was asking him if she could have $20 to go to this Girl Scout thing. And he said, of course, sweetheart, just go into my bedroom on my desk, and there, there's some money in there, just grab it. And she starts walking out towards the garage. He says, where are you going, honey? The bedroom's that way. He says, I already got it. I knew you'd say yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of dead. I want to be. And that's the way your father is. He knows. He knows you need stuff. He just loves giving it to you. It's just the way he is. <clears throat> we, here's, how about this? If we can just get by, we'll be okay. If someone would just look my way and wink at me. <laughs> I mean, son, you know, I just need somebody to hold me. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be happy when uh, someone sends... When he sends me someone, I'll be happy. When I have enough money, I'll be happy. When my house is paid off, I'll be happy. When I get healed, I'll be happy. Okay? <laughs> How about get happy now? And I want you to know, if you're looking for somebody in a relationship, hungry isn't pretty. It is not pretty. If you're hungry, people are not going to want to hang around you. Now, if you're cool and everything's fine, although you may be lonely, but... You say, Lord, I know your favorite to call me, and you are my husband. You are my high tower I hide in. You are the lover of my soul. You are my comforter. You are everything to me, Lord. It, outside of everything, you're the one. And when God is, when all I have is you, you are enough. Amen. Hallelujah. When all you have left is God, God is enough. Is God enough for you today? Amen. Yes. Is God enough? Are you happy with God? Are you happy with God? And are you dreaming bigger? Someone just look my way and wink at me. If you're just looking for somebody to wink at you, something wrong with you. You got to snap the heck out of that and believe God for a little bit more down the line. You're gonna have to find out if that guy's a Christian in love with Jesus more than he's there in love with you. You're gonna have to find out how they're walking with God. You're gonna find out have to find out if that's the one for you. God nailed me. I prayed once. That, you know that song on the radio. It says, "Oh God." I'm, Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that lady I was going to marry, oh God, I'm glad I didn't. Because not there. Anyway. So, <laughs> I remember praying that prayer, and the girl comes up to me and says, you know, there's nobody I'd rather marry than you, but God said you're not my husband. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, that girl's a wonderful girl. She's a wonderful girl, is to this day still a friend of mine, but I thank God I didn't marry her, because I'd have missed Regina, right. and John, and Floyd, and 
my grandkids. Yeah. Oh, oh, glory to God. That I, uh, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And I wrote down here, are you dreaming bigger? Do you care at all if you get anything more than what you got? Are you content with where you're at? Sometimes we got to get up and go, well, look a little more. Now, look, not that you can't be content where you are. Are you aware of the smallness of your vision for your life? God asked me that. Yeah, yeah. He asked me, are you aware of the smallness of the vision for your life? No, I didn't. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought I had a large vision, God. God's vision for my life is greater than my vision for my life. And I've been seeking God for more and seeking God for a greater greater outreach in my heart and in my mind for the things He wants to do through me. But he, my vision is still way too small. Remember Luke, a week before last, we were in uh, Luke 24. Yes, how are you doing? Okay, good. This will be new to you then. <laughs> That's pretty cool. A guy can preach the same sermon like 16 weeks in a row and nobody even knows it. <laughs> I wasn't all the way asleep that day. I'm okay. Okay. In Luke 24, he is talking about to these guys on the road to Emmaus. The two men on the road to Emmaus, and they're depressed. They're upset. The Messiah has died, and they thought he was going to be the Savior of Israel. And so Jesus comes down here and said, um, he gets down to the 24th verse. And certain of those who are with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman said, but him we did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe. You got to underline that. Slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? Now listen to this. And beginning at Moses, Genesis through, and all the prophets, the rest through Malachi, he expounded to them all the scripture, the things concerning himself. Now watch this. Jesus thought it more important to reveal himself in the scriptures rather than in person. What's that do for you? It puts you in equal opportunity. All right, kid, knock it off. <laughs> that kid never swore. Not once. That's cool all the time. But you notice that beginning at Moses, he expounded them from the Word, from the Scriptures. So have you found Jesus in the Scriptures, or are you still looking for him in a burning bush? You know. Moses is up there, got a burning bush. So should I wait for the burning bush or should I go ahead and get Jesus revealed in the Word? He says we have a, a more sure... In 2 Peter 1.19, it says we have a more sure word of prophecy. We saw Him with our eyes. We touched Him with our hands. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. It's the Word of God. Amen. So what we need to do is find Jesus in the Word. And if we're just going to the Word for information or trying to get some promise out of it or something... If you don't find Jesus in there, you haven't found anything. I mean, you can find principles for living that, that are profound. Seriously, you can live by the Word of God without ever knowing Jesus because it's so profound. But I want you to know that the one who's revealed in here is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And with Him, you come into relationship with God because of His blood. And then you can begin to walk in the Spirit rather than just in the flesh. Praise the Lord. Um, remember in John 14... Uh, um, what was Philip? Philip was saying to the Lord, he says, Lord, just show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus says, Philip, have you been with me so long that you don't know that the Father's in me and I'm in the Father? If you don't believe me, just believe the works themselves. We're crying out loud, show us the Father. It... In Luke 18, 8, he says, shall he find faith on the earth when he comes? Will God find faith on the earth? Like, it was a question. Is He going to find any faith? Is He going to find people who have grown up enough, they've been walking with Him for 25, 30 years, and they finally come to a place where they're going to say, okay, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and believe God. Instead, every time something happens in our life, we're going to freak out, throw our hand over our head and say, oh no, what am I going to do? <laughs> You're acting like just every other unbeliever that ever walked the face of the earth. Now, if that's you... You need to go ahead and start to change the way you think. Because the way you're acting right now comes out of the way you've decided to think. Seriously, emotions come out of thinking. Stinking thinking, not thinking, stinking feeling. Now there is something about...
believing God, a person who's believing God, that God will pass over a million people just to annoy you. Somebody who will just take a hold of God. D.L. Moody said, uh, the world is yet to see a person, uh, what God can do through a person who is totally committed to him. The world is yet to see somebody. And what D.L. Moody says is, I'm that guy. That should stir that in every one of us. Uh -huh. I'm that guy. Uh -huh. I'm the guy. I'm a committed dude. And so when I heard that back 30 years ago, I thought, that's me. With everything that's inside of me, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a man of God. I'm going to rise. I was mean. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm meaner now. It's true. Praise the Lord. Uh, I, I just, I'm just amazed at what God can do. I'm just amazed how real God is and how much He wants relationship with us and how much He loves us. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And He wants to give and give and give. And here we are over here begging Him for a, a glass of water when He says, just take it down to the lake, dude. Because that's God's thing out there. We're getting this glass of water hoping we don't spill it. Go ahead and spill some of it. You know, walk down there, slip you up some, you know. Be a guzzler like you were in the old days. <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm not a very, a real, a real dainty guzzler. When I get about, you know, about the third, I'm spilling it all over myself, I don't care. <laughs> Been to a bar lately? People do that. <laughs> Stuff all over them, it's like Regina going to the movies. <laughs> we her get in and no, no, she doesn't like butter because it gets all over her clothes. Oh. So, so we get it unbuttered. Because so, when we get up from the movies, it's just like, <laughs> you guys like that? It is amazing. We get the big one, you know. You can't go to a movie like get popcorn, right? So we get the big one. It costs like 10 bucks. <laughs> anyway, that's why you go. So anyway. I don't know where I went there. Okay. In Psalm 34, jump over to Psalm 34 with me, please. Psalm 34, 1. This is an amazing thing. This scripture has to do with David when he was stuck over in the king of Ashish. Ash, Ash? We'll get back there. I'll read it instead of trying to say it. Psalm 34, it says in the first verse, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Ooh, hallelujah. Fear is a liar. Everything that's... It goes right in there, wasn't it? All right. First Samuel. You were there already, right? First Samuel 21. It says, um, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is David when he flees to Gath. Gath is a Philistine uh, city. This is the enemy city. And he goes down there. And David, in the 10th verse, says, David arose and fled that day from the before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath, and the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did, did they not sing of him to one another in the dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart, and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gates, and let his saliva run down on his beard. I love the Word of God. <laughs> I just, this is great. And Achish said to his servants, Look, you see this man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So they run him off. This is good. David therefore departed from there. <laughs> they, threw his, they threw him out of town. I want you to know. And he escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. <laughs> so he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now you notice this, that back in Psalm 34, how does David do this? 
how does David function in this situation? He's got, what was it? The ones in debt, the ones distressed, and the ones that are discontented. Once you know, these are a bunch of complainers, dude. Yeah, right. And they were bad off. Okay? So, what does he do? He does in Psalm 34, because it says there, a Psalm of David, when he pretended madness before Abimelech, and drove him away, and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. Yes. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Mm -hmm. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear of it and be glad. Now look at what he says. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come, let us exalt his name together. So he took those 400 complainers, the distressed, the, the discontented, and he says, come on, let's praise the Lord. Yeah. Let's praise the Lord. Come on, magnify the Lord with me. Let's get our eyes off of the trouble we're in. Let's get our eyes on the Lord. And what happens? These guys turn into David's mighty men. Did you ever read about David's mighty men? One of them slew a lion in a pit with a spear on a snowy day. The other one killed 800 guys at one time. The other guy oh. killed 1,000 until his hand clove to his sword. The other one snuck down and got the water out of the deep. You know, all these guys, these are the guys. The discontented, the distressed. God calls us not because we're strong. God calls us in our weakness so we can depend on Him. And He says, to the, let the weak say, I am strong. Why? Because they're strong? No, because they aren't. The only reason you're strong is because you depend upon God. Right, right. God can do through the weak what He cannot do through the strong. If you are talented and motivated and all of those things, sometimes it's hard to get through to you. It's just hard to get through to those people who are motivated on their own. They can do whatever they want on their own. They're so talented, so smart, so together. They can do anything. But it's when those people get a hold of God and they start functioning, I want you to know the... Uh, uh, Andy Womack, the people who come to his Karis Bible College, they usually come when they're retired. Mm -hmm. and he says, those are the guys who get on fire for God. Why? Because they've already done the rest. And they mm -hmm. see it didn't do anything. They see they didn't go anywhere. They see they didn't grow in God. So they're there at the Bible College, on fire for God, going off on mission trips and touching people's lives because now they know. They wasted so many years that they could have... See that? Because they come to the end of themselves. When we become dependent on God, just like we read a little while ago in here, when we become dependent on God, we get this childlike faith. You know, when you're a kid, Daddy, catch me! Daddy catches you, and the kid comes down, he says, My daddy can do anything. Right? My daddy can whip your daddy. <laughs> yeah, my daddy can do anything. And then when we mature, those things kind of drop off us because we know our daddy wasn't Superman, but in our life with God, it becomes more that way all the time. The more we, we mature, the more we see that our dependence on God is the only thing you're going to get us through. That's right. And we become more dependent on God, more dependent on God, until all just this, this childlike face says, no, God, God is in control. I thank God for his favor. I might have lost my job today, but God going to give me a better job. Hallelujah. Amen. And you guys, you guys in this have testified over and over and over how God has done that in your life. Yes. How He's healed you when He's finally believed Him. Hallelujah. Now, um, if you want these things to be different in your life, what you need to do is start. Okay? Yeah, you need to start. You need to... Arrival is later, okay? But you need to get started. If you want your thinking to be different, you need to go ahead and change one clock. Just one. Find a scripture. You know, find a guy in the Bible who did something supernatural for God and, and, and look at God and say, hey, you're not a respecter person. Well, you heal him. Huh? You use him to raise the dead. Huh? I want you to know that your father loves it when you do that. I wonder if he remembers. He must. Something about those people who believe God will cast pass over a million others just to anoint you. Amen. Just to anoint somebody who will actually believe that God wants to do something more. God actually loves you enough. Despite your performance, I get this performance thing going on. I'm a performance oriented dude. Man. I think if I'm not doing it perfect, I'm not. That ain't so. God always uses me when I'm the worst guy I've ever met. Didn't they do that to you? Yeah. You just been a nasty second that whole day, you know. They do a terrible thing. God set you up to get somebody healed, or get somebody saved, or, or get somebody counseled into something. And, and you just stand back and go, God, God. He said, "That's right." 
<laughs> that was God. That had nothing to do with you. That's right. You know, he's God. You're not. Get off. Okay. Find a scripture. <laughs> Show your most generous heavenly father. Okay. okay. God's word is a seed, correct? The seed is good? The potential of the seed rests in the soil. You planted in crappy soil, it's not going to grow very good. You plant good soil, it's going to be good. So, if, you, if your life is full of uh, shallowness or no understanding at all, your seed isn't going to grow good. If your life is choked up by the cares of the world and things like that, your seed isn't going to grow good. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We need to go ahead and change the way we think. Change the way we react to stuff. Actually change. You can, you know. <laughs> I love it when couples come to church because then you go home and one guy starts acting up this way he always has and the other guy looks over and goes, uh, I am mad for this morning. You don't have to act like that anymore. That just blesses you, doesn't it? It, it, that's not bad. it just makes you feel warm and fuzzy all over that. <laughs> I wrote down, what is keeping us from our destiny? Ooh, hallelujah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Okay. How about this? Is your mind so noisy that if God spoke, it would be really tough to hear him? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 20, uh, 4.26 says, Ponder the path of your feet and let your ways be established. Sometimes we just got to look at our life and see how our walk is going. we got to ponder that. Now, if you enjoy it, they say, we got to go down and ponder that for a while. I'm going to have to ponder on that one. I guess you can do that in Nevada. Sure. I've been pondering on stuff for a while here. <laughs> okay. Oh, go to Psalm 32. Oh, you're right there. 32 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I got, I, did I tell you about Friday, how I did that? I got to walk with God on Friday. No, we went out, and we decided that we was going to, we was going to, Depend on God the whole day. Because we were on a date. And the thing we do on a date is get out of Dodge. Because <laughs> if we get far enough out of Dodge and somebody calls us, we can't get back in. <laughs> and we usually go where there's no stuff, you know? So, yeah, so we got out there with Regina. She wasn't feeling very good that day because we had these eggs. And they were terrible. I was sick and she was sick. And we kind of food poisoned it a little bit. And we just didn't know what to do, we didn't know where to go, so we just said, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, you, what did it, what it say? We was memorizing this. It says, uh, you will instruct and teach us in the way that we should go, and you will guide us with your eye. So, Lord, do that. So, we were, we were coming through Truckee. We we're going to go north and up and around Beckworth and all out there. It's so beautiful out there. But Regina kind of wanted to go to uh, Tahoe. I don't like going to Tahoe. I hung out at Tahoe when I was a kid. But Tahoe now, you get to, you go up the back way through Squaw Valley and come into Tahoe City there. You come into Tahoe City, you go, oh, look on. And that's it. You're not going anywhere. It's crowded. It's bumper to bumper, clean down to Kings Beach's lease, down to the cut off to Mount Rose. So we went to Tahoe, because happy wife. <laughs> Good night. That's right. Yeah, amen. So we went to Tahoe, we got up there. And we got into Tahoe City and, and from Truckee to Squaw Valley and on up, no, no traffic. We got to, we got to, uh, what did I say that place? Tahoe is? City. Tahoe City. We got Tahoe City right on through there. Yeah, you know, Carnelian Bay. Nobody behind us. Nobody in front of us. It wasn't in a hurry. Digging all the stuff. And there wasn't any traffic the whole way till we got down through Mount Rose down to Reno. Wow. Yeah. How what is that? That is a miracle, man. <laughs> and we I was gonna go the other way just so there wouldn't be any traffic, and lo and behold, God knew what he was doing. We we'll figured that, right? Anyway, that was just a little thing. But on the day went like that. We just kept depending on Lord, quit, kept acknowledging Him because we didn't have any thoughts of our own. Because we were both feeling kind of crappy. 
But after we went up to Tahoe and we got that all, and we went and ate somewhere, and then we felt better, and then we were grooving, and then we were realizing what God did for us. <coughs> and then we got to, and it was just wonderful. So what we did that day is just go ahead and practice what we were going to preach on Sunday. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and will guide you with my eye. I figure his eyes are better than mine. <laughs> yeah. Dependence on God is tougher for the talented, well-educated, strong, and wise. But anybody can get it. In case you're the talented and the wise and the strong and the well-educated, you can still get it. What has to happen? You need to know your need. Your need is not for a good partner. Your need is not for a better job. Your need is for God. Yeah. As far as I can see in my own life, if I'm seeking God, if I'm making that my priority, everything else falls into place. I get the anyway. Okay. You need to ponder on this. <laughs> Deliberate, muse, and reflect. And I wrote it again. When all you have left is God, God is enough. I wrote down here, is he enough for you? Are you happy with God? Are you happy with God? <coughs> it's a good thing to ask yourself. Because I've talked to a lot of young girls here lately that wanted a husband. Some old girls, too. I'm thinking, man, I If you're old, forget about it, man. You made, you made it. You made it. You made it this far. Don't do the relationship thing, man. It's hard. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got a chance. Right. So, so I asked these guys, I asked these guys, are you happy with God? And most of the girls I was talking to aren't happy with God. They aren't happy with their relationship with God. They aren't happy with God only. If God was the only one they'd ever have in their life from now on, they would be unhappy people. So therefore they are unhappy. When you get to a place where you actually have faith in God and He is your number one and number two and number three, then your life is full. Then you're a happy camper. Otherwise, you're not. Do we fulfill one another in a relationship? Yes. God talks about family all the time. But I want you to know, uh, two unhappy people are not going to make each other happy. No, no. If you're dependent on another pre person to make you happy, it ain't happy. It just, you can, it's called missionary dating. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Okay. The person who thinks he can and the person who thinks he can't are both correct. <laughs> I just love that. Right. The person who thinks he can and the person who thinks he can't are both correct. That's right. Thank you. I thought you'd get that a little later on. Should I say it again? <laughs> it took me a while to get it. Come on. Now I want to read you this little thing about seeing. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about imagination and hope. Okay, and I haven't gone very long, so you're okay. Your roast is not burnt. Your hot dogs are still in the grill. Okay, burning crisp. I once heard a story about a pastor's wife who was legally blind. Her glasses were so thick they looked like the bottom of soda bottles. A healing evangelist was preaching in their church one day, and she was trying to avoid him because many people had prayed for her eyes in the past and never got healed, so she didn't want to receive prayer again. We have never been like that. But the healing evangelist cornered her in one of the services and said, I want to pray for you. And he made her take off his glasses and commanded her to close her eyes and be healed. When he had done this, he said, can you see? The woman started to open her eyes and check the vision, but the healing evangelist stopped her and said, shut your eyes. She shut her eyes quickly. Can you see? He asked. As soon as she started to open her eyes, he commanded, shut your eyes. When they repeated the same exchange a third time, she stood there confused with her eyes closed, wondering, what is this man doing? How can I tell if I see if I can't open my eyes? Then she heard the evangelist say, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. You have to see yourself seeing from the inside before you can see on the outside. You have to see yourself healed. Imagination, hope, hope. She stood there with her eyes closed, thinking about what she, he had said. Within minutes, she understood. He was asking, in your imagination, are you blind or can you see? She prayed in tongues for a while and finally said, I can see myself seeing. Now open your eyes, he said. 
She opened her eyes and her vision was perfect. Wow. Amen. These are real stories. These aren't something somebody made up, okay? These are real stories. So, if we can, in our imagination, the Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Now, you hope for things. Hope won't get you healed. Faith gets you healed. But hope is the is the thing that faith feeds off of. Yeah, right. Because if you have no imagination or hope, there's nothing to have faith in. Because faith speaks of future. If it's two minutes or if it's two years, faith always speaks of future. So there has to be hope inside of you to create faith. I want you to know the thing I hear most is hopelessness. You go into council in the world, they're hopeless. The world is hopeless. They have no hope. They haven't got a clue of what to do with their lives because they, they don't have any concept of a God who can do stuff. So there's no hope. So here we are with this great hope inside of us. So we need to go ahead and start walking by faith with hope in our hearts and imagination. What are you imagining for your life? Whatever. What do you imagine your life to be like? What do you imagine your kids' life to be like? What do you imagine your nasty boss's life to be like? What, you know, what, do you, what, what are you using your imagination for? Now, it's easy to use your imagination for negative things. The guy comes and the doctor says, you want to die. What do you do? Start preparing for your funeral. <laughs> the doctor says, you got this thing right here, and it's really going gonna, gonna to get bad. So you start thinking, oh no, what kind of pain pills am I going to take? What am I, what can I do? And what, how am I going to bury myself? And you know, how am I, you know, or you, you lose your, you lose your job. So you start looking for a band to live in. <laughs> or a smaller house, don't get me wrong. Okay, see, see what I'm saying? You can use your imagination for negative things. Yes. Or you can use your imagination, I just lost my job. But the favor of God is upon me, I'm going to get a better job. I'll probably get another better house next month. <laughs> Okay? The doctor just said, I have this. Well, the Bible says, by his stripes I'm healed, so I believe in God that he's already healed me. I'm just going to... Okay? Things like that. On and on and on it goes. It's, it's whatever. And if you, can't, if you can't do that on your own, find something in the Word that says what you need and begin to confess that over your life. Right. You can... Your kids, your parents, your bosses, whatever they're acting like, you can get hung up on that if you want. Or you can ask the Lord what their destiny is, what He believes about them, and start speaking that over them every time you see them. Start thinking that about them. And I've told you a story about my sons. My sons were crazy for a while. Our main prayers were, oh God, don't let them die. Well, they're learning this. Okay? But after a while, God says, and I ask God, what can I do for my son? He says, nothing. You just love them. I said, oh Lord, I'm a preacher. i got to speak something in them. He says, you don't do nothing, you love them. And speak into their lives what I told you they're like. Because I asked God for a vision of them, and he gave me a vision down the road of what their destiny was, where they were going in their life. And we're, we're talking sloppy drunk with whiskey. <laughs> Trying to find the door handle, right? And say, how you doing, young man? You great young evangelist, strong in your body, strong in your mind, strong in your spirit. God bless you. How are you doing today, young evangelist? <laughs> My kid didn't talk to me for 10 years. He hated me for 10 years. He knows it. He can do it on the video. But now, since I started loving him, quit trying to change him, okay? Just start loving him, start speaking good things over him. He even says, good morning. Top of the morning to you, man. How you doing? Things like that. This is a big thing. This is a miracle. Why? Because I just decided that I was going to do what God told me and get a vision for somebody's life start speaking at. Because I can't preach this stuff here unless it works. I'm talking, I'm telling you stuff works. This stuff works. You get a thing from God and you start speaking that into existence. Anybody can speak the negative. Hey, you drunk little fart. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Most people do that. He doesn't like anybody. Yeah. Oh yeah, until you see it on the inside, what you desire on the outside, and you're willing to believe God for it, it just ain't going to happen. You need the word, the word to paint a picture in your life. Praise the Lord. Um, we walk by faith and not by sight. Greater things you're going to do because He's going to be with the Father. 
your attitude of gratitude needs to remain intact. Otherwise, your imagination will grow vain. And it will create nothing but negative things. You need to have an attitude of gratitude. That's why I read to you Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Good times, bad times. When I'm over there with King Asius with the slobber hanging out of my mouth and starts on the door. Oh my. Okay. So, in Ephesians 4, the 17th verse, it says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as other Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. I want you to know something about ignorance. Ignorance is just lack of knowledge, knowledge. lack of information. Mm -hmm. Stupid is you know it, you do it anyway. Okay? So he's talking about ignorance, lack of understanding. And because of this lack of understanding and the blindness of their heart, they're walking as unbelievers. He says, don't walk like that anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not just mere men now. You are believers. You understand this God who loves you Amen. intensely, the things he wants to do in and through your life. Praise the Lord. He, he says, he will keep your heart in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on David. You get your mind where it's stayed on God. Well, how do you do that? Just find the scripture. That one is a good one. Huh? That one is my That's a good one, yeah. That's a good one. Your heart is stayed on. Walk not as others. Okay. Quit thinking like an unbeliever. Put down. Oh, listen to this. If you are put down by your lack of education, your physical stature, your socio socioeconomic status, the things you have, have been spoken over you or uncontrollable circumstances. If you're put down by these things, then you need to change the way you're thinking. So you can go ahead and rise above those things. I know a lady, because she is, doesn't make as much money as the people around her, feels terrible all the time. I, I asked her right out, uh, are they all saved? No, God? No. Are they really happy people? No, they're miserable. I said, how are you feeling today? It's pretty good. Are you saved? Yeah. Where are you going when you die? Heaven. Amen. So, so who's that, is that wrong? <laughs> it's just a little encouragement. She got, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Okay. If you can conceive it in your imagination, you can get a hold of it, okay? Uh, I wrote down here, I can build anything. If I see it on my head, put it down on paper. I can, I can build anything, but I have to see it. I got to see it, and then I have to draw it. This is really important. This is good stuff. I need plants. There you go. See? I need plants. I need something that I can see, and then I can build anything. Now, did I have the imagination to put it on paper? Yes. It conceived in my mind. It was my imagination. I wrote it and drew it on paper. Now I can build it. It's kind of like the Word of God. You, you conceive these things in your imagination. You go to the Word. You see it written on paper. Oh, there it is. Therefore, I can do this thing. There's a plan. Hallelujah, it even has measurements on there. <laughs> I can read a tape. Woo! Okay, so let's go. Um, I'm almost done. God is not a respecter of persons. Faith only produces what imagination and hope have already seen. So your hope is in Christ. So go to 2 Chronicles 16 and we'll end. <laughs> Second Chronicles 16. <laughs> now, if any of you really like babies, <laughs> we have a really cool nursery. <laughs> so these parents would love somebody to just come and hold their babies. <laughs> I'll figure that out. <laughs> Somebody's got it. You know, when I was when I was 12 years old, 12 years old, I was babysitting kids, changing their diapers and stuff like that. But when I got about 38 or 40, I forgot all about how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I, actually, I changed the diaper on a kid one time. And she, anyway, 
I took her <laughs> and, I, and I slid that di diaper off from under her like that and let her sit on the carpet. Oh, oh no. That bike meant she had poop from her head to her feet. Oh, and I just laid her on the carpet and went in and, and I was gonna, I threw that away and I'd come back and I got, oh my God. So I picked her up, you know, and walked around there, took her into the tub and <laughs> it took me two hours to wash up that mess. I thought, man, I was doing this when I was a little kid. What's the matter with me? Come on. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 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 it was like a white rug at that time, too. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no lie. Okay, in 2 Chronicles 16, we'll start up in the 7th verse, it says, And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians or the Lupim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. Listen to this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. I'll read that again. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. There's something about believing God that he will pass over a million people just to anoint you. Amen. So Lord, we thank you that your eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show yourself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to you. Well, God, here we are. So Lord, anoint us. Send us. It's us, Lord. We're the ones. And if not now, then when? If not us, then who? So here we are. We thank you for the opportunities last week. And we thank you for the opportunities that are coming because we are people of faith and we know they are coming. We thank you, Lord, for those who are going to come into the kingdom this week and get healed this week and set free this week just because we're there. We thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I got to do this. Lord, thank you for allowing us to give today. We are so excited about this deal. Your economy is awesome. And Lord, Amen. we thank you for allowing us to uh, supply other people's needs. In Jesus' name. Amen. A fella came through this morning, our brother, and he needed some gas. And I went to get him some money. By the time I got back, he had enough money. He didn't need none from me. Yeah. I mean, if people just, well, here's some money. Here's some money. <laughs> he goes, no, no, we're on the phone. Isn't that cool? So it was pretty cool. So, you know, you guys are just givers. You can't help yourselves. <laughs> this evening is the 20th, like I promised. This evening, we're going to Reno, to Dallas' church, 2nd uh, Street, uh, Voice in the Wilderness Church. You can Google that. It's right next to the police station. It's where the old blood bank used to be. So it's easy to find for you people who used to go to the blood bank. <laughs> <laughs> Someone went to give. <laughs> What's that? Blood bank or plasma center? Plasma Center. The place you sell blood, not buy it. <laughs> that would be the vampire place. <laughs> yeah. So just, just go down, just go down second until you run into it. It's High Street. It's High Street. It goes between a mill and, and or second and first. High Street. Just Google it. I don't, most of my cars don't have them. They have a couple of them. <laughs> so God bless you all. Have a just a really cool day.